So we are ready for chapter two of our book. And in this book, in chapter two, it talks about how energy flows through the ecosystem. And we're gonna look at different layers of that and how those organisms that we have been talking about interact with one another. So when we talk about the roles in which we play here at the very beginning of the chapter on pages 42 and 43, we know that there are three basic ways in which they interact with one another. We know there are producers, and then we know there are consumers, and then we also know that there are decomposers, all of which we've talked about when we talked about classification and different living things and how they are looked at and put into to their different orders and kingdoms of violence. And when we talked about producers, we talked about all those things that have chlorophyll inside of them, that green pigment that through photosynthesis can change the carbon dioxide in the water and they make their own sugar, their glucose on the inside, and then they give off oxygen. So our basic grasses and our basic flowers, any kind of greenery that we would have around us, all of the different types of trees and shrubs that we have on our planet have photosynthesis. If we look at fresh water biomes, then we talk about like the cattails and the lily pads. Or even if we talk about the ocean, we talk with the very beginning with the algae and the photoplankton, how they take the sunlight because of the chlorophyll that's inside of them, and they change into basic in energy. And then we also have a couple different plants. We can talk about seaweed, we can talk about kelp, and those are in the more shallow areas, areas of the ocean, the narratic zone because they're able to attach themselves to the ground and grow long enough to still get some sunlight. But even out in the open ocean, then your algae is gonna be the base level of the producers that carry the energy throughout the uh, energy pyramid. But it all goes back to the idea that the sun is the beginning of every food chain or food web on our planet. It's the sun's energy that is taken and transformed into usable energy here on our planet by animals and organisms beginning with the producers. The consumers then, we have different layers of consumers. We know that herbivores, we've talked about before, are the animals that are designed to eat the plants. They eat the consumers. They are autotrophs because they don't create their own energy. They have to eat something else. But they will only eat the plants. And we have small ones and we have large ones. It just depends on how their mouths are set up and how they're designed in order to decide what they can eat. Even our little itty bitty caterpillars, they don't necessarily have teeth, but they have mandible claw looking things that sit there and they grind up the leaves. We looked at one picture, it was the mouth of a snail and how it has these little blades that shred up the leaves and the grass that they're eating. Even out in the ocean, we have some very base level herbivores. Now, manatee are they're actually quite larger, bigger than humans, but their mouths are designed where they don't really have teeth. They just have jaws and they gum everything, but they're only going to eat plants. So a lot of times you'll see organisms such as these large ones that they just have either big teeth in the front, their front incisors to cut and slice it, or most of their teeth are just the giant molars that sit there and grind everything up. Or like the manatee or the bottom jaw of elephants, it's just gum. And they, with their jaw, they grind everything up slowly as they eat. And then our book shows us an image of a carnivore. And carnivores, we know, are just meat eaters. That's all they eat and that's all they thrive on. Our alligators and crocodiles, our lions, or any of our large cats are all designed to be carnivores. Polar bears are also carnivores. Now, most bears are not carnivores, but polar bears are because they don't have the shrubs and the berries and the things like that that they can eat up in the cold areas. Then we have our flying carnivores, that they're designed not necessarily with the teeth to tear things apart, but these guys, their beaks are sharp and curved, so they can tear and shred things apart, and they have these talons that these long nails will go into and hold on to their prey as they're tearing it apart to eat. But we also have carnivores out in the ocean as well. The shark, the most common and most popular carnivore out in the ocean. But we, we don't necessarily think about it, but whales are carnivores also. All they eat are creel, and creel are these little itty bitty teeny tiny shrimp that eat the photoplankton and the algae that's floating out in the ocean. So they are also classified as a carnivore, even though they don't have these sharp teeth that are gnarly to tear things apart, they have brill to filter out the creel from the water. 
And then we have the omnivore, and the omnivore, they eat both. They're happy with plants and they're happy with animals. Most of our bears are they set into the omnivore category because they will eat the berries, but they'll also eat the fish or anything else that, that they can get a hold of. Chickens. Well, chickens don't have teeth, do they? But they're, they have short, long, straight beaks. They're not curved like the carnivore. A chicken will eat anything. You throw it out there in the yard, they're going to eat it. From bugs to, I've seen chickens eat shredded bacon before. So they'll eat whatever you get them, even the corn that you put in their feed. Hogs are the exact same way. I've seen people that give leftover pork roast and, and bacon and stuff to a pig. Kind of sad to think what they're doing, but they will eat whatever you put in front of them. They're an omnivore. Monkeys are giant primates, are definitely omnivores. They will eat any meat, they will eat any fruit, they will eat any vegetable, but so will the little guys. They're all omnivores as well. And then you have the top chain of the food chain with the omnivores, and that would be any humans. We are designed with sets of teeth that we have, the big molars to help us grind anything down that we eat that would be classified as a plant, but we also have the incisors to cut and the canines to tear into, and we can eat whatever it is that we're interested in eating. Then you have the category that's kind of a subcategory of that, and that's a consumer or a scavenger. And they're designed to find anything that's dead and rotting, and then that's what they eat. They wait until it's dead and rotting. Buzzers, you'll see buzzers in our area floating around up in the sky until something has died. They generally will wait about three days when all of the gases in the body have built up and it begins to tear itself apart and fall apart, and then that's what they enjoy snacking on. Crows is another one that's a huge one in Indiana. A lot of people don't think about crows, but you'll see crows anytime that there's been, you know, roadkill on the side of the road. They come and they gather the exact same thing, just like the buzzards. But catfish out in the fresh water, catfish are scavengers. They like rotting flesh as well. Uh, when I was a kid, I always went uh, catfish uh, with went to get catfish with my grandfather and he always used chicken livers that have been sitting out for like a day and all that was foul smelling stuff but sure enough those catfish they would come right to it and grab onto it and when you talk about teeth well the catfish they don't necessarily have teeth but scavengers can have any kind of setup with their mouth sometimes they have the long hooked beak like the hawks and the eagles or the straight beaks just like the chickens but they also can have a mixture of the canine teeth um, as well as, uh, you know, the molars to grind and tear things up. And then our next level that we talk about are the decomposers. And the decomposers are so important to our planet. Without the decomposers, we'd have a buildup of all this rotting material of organisms covering our planet. The decomposers go into action anytime something is beginning to die and decay. And so like our fungi, our toadstools and our mushrooms, they're going to break down that plant material that's in the soil and they begin to break it up into its natural nutrients that go back into the soil and they replenish the soil by returning all of those things to it and then the worms do the same thing but the worms they go through the soil and they, they process the soil through their body but it just passes through they're breaking down all those plant materials but also animal materials that have began to fall apart and go back into the ground they break it down for us. We have molds that attach themselves to food, and as food goes bad, it begins to break it down into its natural nutrients as it begins to rot. And then you got your critters that like to also scavenger for things, but they are decomposers as well. These little guys, they'll scavenge underneath the rocks and underneath the rotting wood under logs like this, but they're a decomposer because what they're doing is they're taking all of that stuff that is decaying and they help it decay even more by eating it and breaking it down. And same with the uh, dung beetle. But it all goes down to the idea that our bacteria is throughout our planet and the bacteria throughout our planet is designed to make things decompose. If you think back to our first field trip to the poop plant, they added bacteria into that mucky water and that what they were doing is, you know, as we call them the poop munchers, they're eating those solid waste and they're breaking it back down into natural nutrients and then they just kill off the bacteria and they return the clean water back into the world. When we talk about how that energy flows then, we have talked and briefly looked at 
the idea of a food chain or an energy chain. You'll see it listed as both ways. But it's how does it begin all the way through? And once again, if they try to trick you and ask you what the beginning of the food chain is. Now, there's two different ways they can ask that question and sometimes it's a tricky question. If it is just simply what is the beginning of a food chain or a food web or the beginning of all energy on our planet, then that answer is the sun. If they ask what is the beginning of the energy in this image, then if we take the sun off, then you would have to say, well, it's the autotropes or the plants that are changing the sun's energy. So you really have to pay attention when you're reading questions to figure out what it is that they're asking. If it's multiple choice and the sun's there, then you go with the sun because you know that's the beginning of your food chain. But a food chain or an energy chain is just telling you that we go from the sun, the sun's nuclear energy, is transformed in the autotropes through photosynthesis. They take the sunlight, the carbon dioxide that's in the air around them, the water from the soil, they mix it all up, they get sucrose, which is the sugar inside of them, and then they exhale, like kind of like we do, but they give off oxygen, and then we can continue. But then their energy is stored as sucrose, and then that energy is transformed by the grasshopper or anything that's going to eat the autotroph, and it's going to become ATP inside of their bodies. And then that's going to get eaten, and that ATP gets transferred into ATP for that body. And so we're constantly passing on the energy from one source to another. From our nuclear energy in photosynthesis, changed to sucrose. Sucrose changed to ATP, that's in our cellular respiration when our cells digest food and it creates its energy that it needs. And then the next level is also going to take that ATP and transform it to its own ATP inside of its body as that cellular res respiration is taking place. You can look at any type of food chain. Now, a couple years ago on the ice that they had something kind of similar to this because they put it as a circle and you were supposed to identify it. And I had some sixth graders say, well, that's a food web. It's not a food web because arrows have to go to different organisms this is a food chain, even though they did it as a circle. Well, why did they do that? To trick you and make sure that you really did understand what it was you were looking at. Because what happens is after this fox dies, well then it's going to have some decomposer that's going to break it down. And that's what this is showing. The sun gives its energy to the autotroph for the grass that goes to the grasshopper, to the bird, the snake, the owl. But when that owl dies, it's going to go back to the soil and the decomposers are going to break it down. A food web, like I just said, has to have different lines, different arrows. And if you follow this along, it gets a little confusing at times, but we can figure out where it's going. Notice there's no lines or arrows to this decomposer. Because what we understand is everything at the top that dies, anything that goes to the ground and begins to rot is going to be dissolved or broken up by the decomposer. But we go from the sun once again, giving its energy to the plants, the autotropes, which change it through photosynthesis to the next level of organisms that are going to eat it. And then those could be eaten by several things. So if we just focus on the grasshopper, from the sun to the grass to the grasshopper, and it can be eaten by a shrew, it can be eaten by a heron, it can be eaten by a garter snake, it can be eaten by a frog. Now, with the arrows on the food chain and food web, one of the things I don't know that I've mentioned this year, and I want to make sure you understand, is that the arrow head, the tip of the arrow, is telling you the next thing that gets the energy. So it gets its energy from the grasshopper. It gets its energy from the grasshopper. It gets its energy from the grasshopper. That seems logical, but that was a question and has been a question for several years. The arrow points to, and what does that mean? It means that this gives its energy to that organism. When we go from the grasshopper then we can see that the fox, the fox will get energy from the shrew, the heron will get, or the fox will get energy from the heron. The, it doesn't show that it eats the snake, so we would skip that one, but it does show that it, it also eats the frog. So we can choose any food chain. Some questions I've seen on the ISTEP test that says here's a food web, write down a food chain this shows the flow, energy flow, that is inside of it. So you could say from the sun, 
to the plant, to the snail, to the shrew, to the fox. Or from the sun, to the plant, to the snail, to the shrew, to the heron, to the fox. As long as you connect them, what would make a straight line, even though it's not laid out in a straight line, then you're identifying a food chain or an energy chain in it. But then you can see that the grass can be eaten by the crayfish or the snail, and then it can go in any direction. As long as the arrow is going from that organism to another, then it's giving its energy to the frog will get its energy from the crayfish. When it's done, then everything goes back to the ground and it begins to be decomposed by all sorts of things. When it, we have a photosynthesis from a change, then everything goes into ATP. Here's where the sucrose is from photosynthesis, and then this level, this level, this level changes it into ATP and continues the form of ATP going through. And then when we're at the top, it dies, it begins to break down and decompose, and we have all sorts of decomposers that do that. Our fungus, our different bugs that are decomposers, our worms, our bacteria, everything takes its energy and begins to break it down. Now in your, oh, sorry. So another type of food web that you can see is you can talk about the uh, water food webs. And we have the sun changing things into the photoplankton. Has to be photoplankton because it has to have that photosynthesis capability. And then how the little organisms eat the photoplankton. And then the larger organisms eat them and so on and so forth until we see that they're the largest of the levels are being eaten. Notice that the wading birds are the higher point of the food web or the food direct chain there. Or that the large fish actually can continue and then be eaten by those large birds. That the sea duck is eaten by the bald eagle but the bald eagle does not eat the tundra swan or the wading birds. So it's just figuring out what all that's showing you. Now, in your book, it also tells you different levels. And I've seen on the I-step test a couple of words that are a little tricky. I'm going to show you what those mean. But what they're just showing you is that when we have our producers, that they have the very base form of energy through photosynthesis, and they make that sugar to add to the food, food web. So this line going across in your book shows you, this is called a first level consumer. So they eat the, the producers. A second level consumer, what do they eat? Well, they don't eat the grass. The secondary level consumers eat the first la layer or first level consumer, which eat the producers. Notice that I put the word secondary. That's one of those tricky words. Now it's pretty obvious as to what it means. It just means it's the second level. But the tertiary was thrown in on the I step the past two years. And that's not a word that I use in a common everyday language unless I'm teaching it. And I wouldn't expect my sixth graders to use that word that as a regular uh, idea either. So tertiary just means it's the third level. And what does the third level eat? The third level consumer eats the second level consumer. It doesn't go down and eat the grass. Now there are some animals I know that eat the grass that don't normally eat it because they have an upset stomach like their cats will chew on grass if their stomach's upset, but that's to help their, their bellies, not because they're getting nutrients from it. Tertiary or third level consumers eat secondary level, and secondary eat first, and then the first eat the producers. And then everything goes back down to the decomposers that are going to break down any wastes or solids or remains that's from our organisms. The last I did in it on page 48 of this section of your book is a energy pyramid. And what an energy pyramid does is it's showing you how the energy changes from the base level going all the way to the top. And it actually decreases as we go from the producers up. Our producers are always the autotrophs. Autotrophs, once again, they make their own energy inside their cells through photosynthesis because they have chlorophyll that changes the sunlight into sucrose for them. But our heterotrophs are all these organisms that they consume anything down below. What an energy pyramid shows you then, if you look underneath where it has these percentages, it's showing you from the very base level that the producers have 100% of energy inside of them. 
but as I go up, the herbivore only gets 10% of that energy. And so it has to eat a lot of this in order to sustain its level of health. And then this level only gets 1% of that energy. And so the amount of energy per item that's being eaten gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the higher up we go in the level of a food web, it means the more food we have to eat because that energy goes from 100% all the way down to a hundredth of a percent. So a shark, for instance, in this image, has to eat more and more and more and more to get enough food in order to sustain itself because energy decreases as it goes up. That's what a food pyramid is trying to show you. That is our lesson that's going to take most of our class time. That's why I wanted to make sure I did a video so that you would have time to grab your assignment and at least get started on it and then work on it any time that you have downtime today.